Hi guys, Mark here with Walter's World, and today we're going to talk about consumer behavior. Now I have my consumer here, Trouble, you can see we have a nicely named Trouble here. We're trying to decide, what does this baby want? He just woke up, so he's not very happy. He's hungry. Look at him. He's like, oh, I want something. So what's he going to take? What's he going to go for first? He goes for the passy because he's tired and just waking up. But then he goes for a ladle. He hasn't had breakfast and he goes for a ladle? What's going on? And that's the kind of frustration that marketers have when they try to understand consumer behavior. Because you think, oh, well, the baby just woke up. He should be hungry, so he probably is going to want to drink the bottle. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way. You saw he went for the passy first, and you might think, well, that makes sense because he's a baby and they like their passy. But a ladle? Why would he want a ladle? Is he going to go cook his own food or just want something to play with? And we see each, each situation is different. And the more you know your customers, the more you know your consumers, the better you can plan things. Okay? For example, for me, I know this consumer very well. I mean, it's like I've been there since he was born. And I know he loves his, his red passy. If I would put a different passy there, it might not have worked, so I was giving him something he wanted. Remember, the need, reg, need recognition, he likes red, so I give that to him. But then, I also know his, his purchasing behavior in terms of I know what he goes for first and his favorite toys are spatulas and ladles and stuff like that. So I had a rough idea that would be there so I knew that could be a toy for him. Also I know how he buys in terms of what he likes to eat. He doesn't like to drink or eat first thing in the morning so he takes some time. So eventually, oh, my little man will do that. And look, he's finished with his stuff and so he brought back his ladle and his passy. So I hope that helps you get a rough idea of you know, trying to understand consumer behavior. I'd like to thank our, I'd like to thank, oh, I'd like to thank my helper here, Mr. Trouble. Oh, he loves his daddy. Oh, I can't say it. He's an un, unnamed source. Yeah, go, go get it, go get it. And I hope that gives you a rough idea of consumer behavior. How You know, you really can't tell, but you can do your best guess by doing your best research. And that's why you need to know the decision-making process of consumers because then you have a better idea of how can I make them happy? How do I make sure they're going to do that? Because I'm sure not too many people were thinking ladle when they were thinking of a hungry morning baby. So we've seen what trouble did, okay? But let's go through the decision making process so it can help us better understand not just the baby but consumers in general because consumers do go through a five-step process when they are looking to buy stuff. One, need recognition. Two, information search. Three, alternative evaluation. Four, they purchase a product. And five, there's post-purchase behavior. And so we're going to go through each of these. Now, the first step when it comes to the decision-making process is need recognition. People have to realize that they need something. You know, the baby, we looked at him and said, well, we thought, well, he'd probably be hungry because he needs to eat in the morning. But again, we never know what actually happens, but we see there's going to be a need, so we could offer him milk, and maybe he'll go there. But the thing is, people have two basic needs. One, you have functional needs, okay? And functional needs is we have to buy, get, buy something or have something that actually serves a purpose. So if I'm hungry, I need to have something that's going to fill me up. So for a baby, yes, milk will do it. But then you have the second kind of need, which is called a psychological need. And the psychological need are these things that I need something that makes me feel better. Food. Okay, so you look at those two different kinds of needs. Now the thing is, what we as marketers, there's differences between needs and wants. And you have to determine that because the needs are things you have to have to survive, and wants are the things you'd like to have. And a job as a marketer is to turn those wants and to make them feel like it's a need. So you have to get it. You have to get the newest iPhone. You have to get the newest Mac. All these kind of things. Okay? So that's the first thing. Need recognition. Now, the second part of the decision-making process is information search. Because consumers have to figure out, well, what should I buy? And the thing is, if you don't know, of course you're going to search more. But if I say, hey, where do you want to go to dinner tonight? You're going to think in your head, mm, what are my favorite restaurants? Let's go there. Thinking in your head, that's an internal search. But let's say you're going to a new town. You know, I've, I haven't been to New York in years, so if I'm going to go there to eat, maybe I'm going to look online and see what I should go and eat. Okay, that would be an external search. If you go and search things outside your brain, that's an external search. And the, the, when people look for information, there's a few things that kind of influence how much information they're going to search for. One is the perceived cost of the search versus the perceived benefit. So is it worth my time and effort to research what the best candy bar is, or should I just go to the vending machine and buy it? 
I just go to the machine, see a Snickers, hey, that's fine. I'm not going to do too much research because there's not much risk to it. It's like, ah, if, I'm not, if I don't like the Snickers, I've only lost a dollar. But if it's going to have more risk, then I'm going to put, there's before it's more benefit. If I do my research, like I'm going to buy a house, then people do more information search for it, okay? Um, other thing that influences the amount of search they do is what we call locus of control. How much do people feel like they're in control of things? So if I search more, like for example, let's say you're picking stocks. Well, if you're searching this, yeah, I can find the best stock. Well, you have an internal locus of control. You're the one that knows, hey, if I, if I do the research, I'll probably pick the best one. I'll, pick, you know, I'll beat the market. That's internal. Some people have an external locus of control. They feel, you know what, no matter what I do, I'm not going to get the best stock, so I'm just going to buy a mutual fund. And the last thing that kind of influences it is the, the amount of risk they're taking on. Because if we think about it, more financial risk, the more expensive it is, probably the more information you're going to search. Okay, you don't just walk out and buy a house that costs $200,000, but you will just walk out and buy a Snickers that costs a dollar. Okay, another thing you might look at is safety risk. Okay, if you're going to be bungee jumping, you're probably going to, or skydiving, you're going to look and see, what's the safety record of these guys? Or the doctors, you're going to have surgery, what's their survival rate of surgery? You know, that safety risk is going to come in there. Also, you have psychological risk, social risk, um, you know, there's all kinds of things out there that people kind of look at in terms of risk that will influence how much they search. So the more risk we have in our decision, the more research and the more information we're going to be searching for. Okay, so now we're on the third step, alternative evaluation. Now, when we have alternative evaluation, sometimes people, you know, if I say, what's the difference between McDonald's and Burger King? And when you say, well, one's fast and one's got the Whopper, those are determinant attributes, kind of characteristics that make the difference between two different alternatives. And that's what you start to do. You look at this. Well, what can I do with these alternatives? What are they worth for me? Well, how are they different? So if we look at the baby, he had a pacifier. So what's that for him? That's soothing. Next, he had a bottle. What's the bottle for him, that alternative? What's special about that? Oh, it fills up my belly, so I'm full. And the third alternative, the ladle. What does that do for me? I can whack it around and make lots of sound and have fun with it. So those are the two, three, three ways he's kind of looking at, these three options. Okay. Now, for customers, what they do is they look at those alternatives out there. Okay, whether it's all, usually you don't look for everything, you have certain ones you're looking for, and you kind of rank them between the two. So if I'm looking to buy a tablet, okay, I can get an iPad, I can get a Nook, I can get a Kindle, I can get something from Toshiba, I can get, see it, get a Nexus, there's all kinds of things out there, and you start to say, what's the different ones? Well, I say, well, Apple, well, that one has all the cool apps and all these things, but it's $5.99. Yes, it's kind of expensive, but it has all those things, but the Kindle Fire HD is $199, but it's not as powerful, not as many things, but it's so much cheaper, and people start comparing things. So you see them comparing the different alternatives, and some of the main things people do determine alternatives for are obviously are price. So if you think about it, if you're going to go see your boss, you're going to buy your boss a $3 bottle of wine, or you're going to buy your bottle a $50 bottle of wine. Probably the 50, because even if you're not a wine connoisseur, you know if I spend 50 bucks, it's probably going to be a good bottle of wine. That's one thing. Another thing is brand. You know, some people, it doesn't matter. They say, hey, you know what, I love Macs, I love Apple, I'm going to buy anything Apple. If you know that, you can price it that way. Your alternatives, you know, there's less alternatives for those people because they're brand loyal. Coke, Pepsi have these same kind of things. That's why they put a lot of advertising out there to get people to like their brand associated with it so it limits their alternatives because they're not willing to switch to a Pepsi or a Coke depending on what they like. And then the last one is product presentation. If you make your stuff look really pretty and all these kind of things, people are more willing to buy it. Think about it, when you go to a restaurant, okay, and you're so full, you know, it takes a lot to get me full, but you get so full, like, oh, I can't eat anymore. They're like, oh, would you like dessert? No, no, I'm fine. But then they push that dessert cart by. Don't you go, oh, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I can have a piece of red, red velvet cake. Oh, maybe I can have that. And you see that because of the presentation. So those things can influence the alternative valuation, what I'm going to go for. And then we have number four. Boom. The purchase. The actual transaction. People actually buy the product, use the product. These kind of things. Yes, our job is done. No. When you sell your product and it's been purchased, that's not the end of the decision-making process because people buy products again and again. You don't buy one home, you'll buy another home probably later in your life. You don't buy one car, you buy a car every 10 years. And if we're sellers and we, we stop caring at the purchase, they'll never come back again. Okay? And that takes us to the fifth part, the post-purchase.
Okay. Now, in the post-purchase, we obviously want to develop customer satisfaction. So we're going to do things to make sure the customers are right. But how do we do that? And one of the things which seems silly, like you think, well, I have to promote my product so much and make it look so great so people buy it. But if you overhype your product, people will be disappointed. Okay. So you want to take that into account. Another thing you want to look at is you want to look at you know, kind of demonstrating your product so that people see how it's really supposed to work. Because you ever had a product where you're kind of like, Hey, yeah, what's wrong here? Like, oh, if you do this, I'm like, oh, so I can do that smart type on my phone. I didn't know. Oh, thank you. You help people learn how to use their product better, and then they become more happy, and then you build customer loyalty, and then they come back, and you make more money off them, all kinds of stuff. So there's the customer satisfaction side of things. You know, think long-term of your product, your, your customers. Another thing you have to look for in the post-purchase behavior is what's called cognitive dissonance, or maybe you've heard of it called buyer's remorse. I mean, think about it. Have you ever spent a lot of money buying an Xbox or a car or a house? You're like, ooh, maybe we spent too much money on that. Oh, I don't know. Was that the right choice? Or if you go out to a bar and you have that last beer and the next morning you're like, oh, I don't know if that 10 Jägermeister was a good idea. Ugh. Okay? Those kind of things are buyer's remorse. I spent the money, now I feel bad about it. We, as marketers, have to make sure that people don't have that cognitive dissonance. They don't feel bad about the purchase. So what do you do? You send out the customer cards. You check up with them. So you're enjoying your product. Hey, look at all these awards we've won. The version, you, the, the Honda or the Ford that you bought now is, you know, J.D. Power, the car of the year. Don't you feel good? Oh, it's getting accepted. So people feel better about their purchase. And you have to work with these things. Okay, but if also in a post-purchase thing, you have what are called, you know, unhappy customer, unsatisfied customers, whatever, and the internet has allowed people to voice their concerns a lot more. And as a company, you need to be out there. That's why you have the social media. Check out a social media video to help you with that. Have your social media help deal with customer relationships, good and bad. Don't ignore them. Learn from them because you can turn some of your most pissed off customers into some of your biggest proponents because you help them fix their problems. Okay, so I hope that helps, gives you an idea of the consumer decision making process. First, you have need recognition, they have to realize there's something they need. Two, the information search, they go out and find out what, they're gonna, what, they, what they need. This is where we market and stuff like that. Three, alternative evaluation, how do they choose between the two, or three, or 20 options. Four, they make their purchase, and five, you work on developing good relationships in the post-purchase side of things. Now, we look at our baby, and you kind of go, oh, well, where does this all work? Well, you need recognition. I knew he would either be hungry or tired or want to play. Those are the three needs a baby pretty much has. Sleep, eat, happiness. Information search, well, what's he going to do? Well, I laid the, the three options out in front of him. So he said, oh, okay, I have one of these three things. That's what I got. And did you notice, one of his options was to come back to Dad and give him a big hug. Yeah, that's something else out there. We're not even thinking about that. Then you look at the purchase, that's when he went in for the buy, so he went for the passy. Now why did he do that? I talked about that, you know, he just woke up, so it soothes him, and then he wanted to play. And then post-purchase behavior, what can we do to make him more happy? Hey, we give him a big hug and make him feel better, okay? Now, when you have customers, they're sometimes they're not that simple, but if we understand their decision-making process, where we could influence it, it could help us make more money and do a better job as marketers. So, I hope that helped. If you want to learn more about marketing, please check us out at our website at www.waltersworld.com. And please, like and favorite this video. And, well, don't worry about the baby. He got his milk in the end. So, bye. And now, right after we finish, he starts drinking because now it's breakfast time. And just so you know, no chumbas were injured in the filming of this video.